Let's pray. We are thankful this morning that we are in your presence and that we are, um, we have your power available to us. We pray that you would work among us today, help us to hear your word, to understand it, and to be changed by it. In the name of Jesus, amen. I started studying the book of Daniel seriously about 13 years ago uh, when I agreed to teach a seminary class on the book. And uh, up to that point, honestly, Daniel was not really a book I wanted to spend a whole lot of time in. Um, aside from the stories in the first half, which are familiar and beloved, you know, we've got Daniel in the lion's den, we've got the handwriting on the wall, um, all sorts of great stories. But when you get to the second half of the book, it's just a little weird, isn't it? And it's a little, it's a lot difficult. And uh, I struggled with that, those visions, because I grew up in a tradition where they were primarily used for what they might tell us about the end times and how we might think about um, future events in light of them. And they might have their place in that perspective, but that's not really what they're for. And I was delighted and greatly relieved when I discovered that. Um, I love this book now, and it is incredibly relevant for us today. Um, in it, we discover how amazing and how great God is. And I discover what it means to belong to him. And I find encouragement to endure whatever life might look like. Sometimes life looks great, sometimes it doesn't look so great. And Daniel speaks to those times. Now, for 11 weeks this summer, we've been taking the book apart. We have gone chapter by chapter, story by story, and vision by vision. And I'm guessing that some weeks, you may have gone home inspired and encouraged. I have high hopes. And other weeks, I'm pretty sure you went home disturbed and a little bit confused, or a lot confused. Uh, at least I did, so I assume you might have too. In this last week in this series, I want to spend some time putting the book back together for you. Um, now, I titled this series, Stand, Take Heart and Stand Firm. And I titled it that because I think that captures the twofold takeaway of this book. We can be encouraged and we can stand firm, no matter what life looks like no matter what we might encounter for our allegiance to God. We can be encouraged and we can endure. But the only reason we can do that is because of what we learn about God in this book. Encouragement is empty if God cannot do what we need him to do. Standing firm is pointless if this life is all there is. But the book of Daniel from start to finish reveals to us the God who is king of all the earth. He is king of an eternal kingdom. And one day, we don't know when, but one day that kingdom is going to destroy all other kingdoms and it will fill the earth. Our God can do what we need him to do. And we, his people, will rise from the dead to inherit and rule that kingdom with one like a son of man. Jesus himself. This life is not all there is. So first this morning, I want to reflect on the kingship of God, on that higher throne that we have been singing about all summer. How does the book of Daniel show us God's kingship? And what does it show us? And to answer that question, we're actually going to start with a psalm today. We're going to read Psalm 47. And it's sometimes called an enthronement psalm. And what that means is that this is a psalm that celebrates God's kingship. There are several of these in the book of Psalms. I just picked this one. So listen and read along uh, with Psalm 47. The God that this psalm describes is the God the book of Daniel reveals. So Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome the great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under his feet, under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God 
is the king of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham, for the kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. The word of the Lord. Did you hear the language? Most high, great king over all the earth, subdues nations, chose our inheritance, king of all the earth, reigns over the nations, seated on his holy throne. All of these titles and ideas are found in the book of Daniel. God is revealed as Lord of all the earth. He's not just God of the conquered nation of Israel and their king, remember Jehoiakim, and the territory of Judah. In a world that considered gods to be rulers of designated territories, Israel's God claimed to be Lord of all those lords and God of all those gods and king of all those kings. The heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool. The book of Daniel reveals God's kingship to us in at least two ways. First, it, does, it reveals God is king of all the earth in the way that it talks about him the words and the names that it uses to refer to him and the way that it describes him. For example, the covenant name of Israel's God. Do you remember the covenant name, the personal name of Israel's God? Yahweh. It's all capital, capital letters, Lord, in your English Bibles. That name is all over the pages of the Old Testament, but you have to look hard to find it in the book of Daniel. It is only in chapter 9 when Daniel confesses the people sin to that God. Instead of this book being dominated by that personal covenant name, Yahweh, the book of Daniel is full of names and titles for God that make it clear he is not merely Israel's covenant God. His authority and his rule are not confined to one nation. In this book, he is the God of heaven, the King and the Lord of heaven, He's called God of gods, Lord of lords, great God, living God, God on high. But this majestic and glorious God is also described as our God, my God, your God, the God of the covenant, one who is compassionate and forgiving. One of the most common titles for God in the book of Daniel is Most High God. We hear it from Nebuchadnezzar, after he witnessed God's deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. We hear it again from Nebuchadnezzar when he recounts how the Most High God humbled him in chapter 4. And we hear it from Daniel when he indicts Belshazzar for failing to learn the lesson of Nebuchadnezzar's humbling. We hear it again in the interpretation of Daniel's vision of the four beasts when the one like a son of man receives the eternal kingdom and the holy ones and the people of the holy ones inherit it with him. In Daniel 2, God is referred to as the God of heaven when he reveals the future to Gentile king Nebuchadnezzar and then when Daniel seeks the wisdom to understand the dream. In addition to these names and titles that the book uses for God, it also reveals God as king over all the earth through his interactions with the Gentile kings. Now, in the first six chapters, the book recounts confrontations between Israel's God and human Gentile kings Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and Darius. And in each of these encounters, God reveals his superior power and wisdom, as well as his expectation that human rulers acknowledge his sovereignty. As each of these kings flex their muscles before the Most High God, God responds with a display of his infinite power and wisdom. The rulers of the world discover that they and their gods are no match for this God. And in fact, they actually depend on him for their life, not to mention their kingship and their power. But interestingly enough, and counterintuitively for us, God's power and his wisdom are not always obvious in the book. And worse, 
they sometimes appear to be missing. In the opening verses of the book, so many weeks ago, remember that was back in June. Ah, uh, June. <laughs> I love September, but ah, uh, June. <laughs> In the opening verses of the book of Daniel, we encountered a situation that any ancient Near Easterner would have interpreted as the weaker God of Israel losing to the stronger God of Babylon. Do you remember? In Daniel 1 and 2, Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, defeated its king, Jehoiakim, looted the precious sacred vessels from the temple in Jerusalem. And history tells us that he went on to burn Jerusalem and destroy it eventually. But the narrative subtly hinted to us that things were not exactly as they appeared. The Babylonian god Marduk did not defeat the god of Israel. Rather, we learn that God gave his people and his land and his temple and his king into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had them because God gave them to him. So it may have looked to everybody as if Israel's God had been defeated, but we were given the real story. What really happened is that God was in control of those events that were happening on the world stage. But Daniel 1 isn't the only time in the book that God's power is restrained or hidden or held back. It's especially evident in the apocalyptic visions, chapters 7 through 12. In those four visions, Daniel saw horrifying events that were going to happen to his people after they returned to the land of Israel after exile. And Daniel saw that God's faithful people would suffer to the point of death, and he also saw that, shockingly, God himself would suffer loss. But the book of Daniel still makes it clear that none of these losses was for lack of God's power. We repeatedly hear in those visions that there was an appointed time for those oppressors, for the evil, for the suffering, and then it would be over. God's victory was sure. So while history may appear to be running amok sometimes, things are not as they seem. Israel's God has such control of the world that he does not have to run frantically about responding to every assault as we wish he might. He does not have to rush about trying to fix things. He does everything at exactly the right time, even though it may cost his people and himself something in the process. We don't usually understand that, do we? We don't understand the wisdom behind what looks like a display of weakness. We think God should always show up, defeat his enemy, and rescue his people, right? Has anybody ever prayed for that? God, defeat the enemy. Show up, I need you. Rescue me. Save this person, that person. You probably have your list. It makes sense to us that God would get the most glory when everybody sees how powerful he is. That's not how God works. He often chooses to work within the limits of his own creation rather than to wow the world with his supernatural acts. He is not always a God of shock and awe, is he? What God chooses to do and not do are often a mystery to us. His wisdom runs counter to our expectations. But the book of Daniel reminds us that in spite of all those appearances, the God of Israel is the God of the nations. And until his kingdom comes in all its fullness, we can trust that he is in control. He could wipe the planet clean if he wanted to. He could do it right now. But in his wisdom, he chooses not to. He is all powerful and all wise, despite what the headlines might suggest. So take heart, my friends. Our God is the one on the throne. And stand firm because this life is not all there is. The book of Daniel is the only place in the Old Testament where we get a clear picture that what awaits God's people is resurrection and reward, reigning over God's kingdom with the one like a son of man forever. But that clear picture is still just a taste, barely a taste of this glorious future. And thankfully for us, the New Testament goes a lot further. 
And perhaps the well, most well-known passage is one I read from at the end of last week's service. It comes from Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. And I want to read Paul's words at length this morning. We'll divide it up, but I want to read them because they're so important for us. They are the reason we can stand firm. So let's start with verses 1 through 5, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, and then to the twelve. The word of the Lord. Paul says, this is the gospel. This is the message that you are banking your life on. This is the message that will save you. And he'll go on to say, this is the message that guarantees your resurrection. And here's the message. Christ died for your sins. He was buried, and he was raised again. And all of that is according to the scriptures, by which Paul would have meant the Old Testament. And what is more, we don't believe this in blind faith. Paul says, the resurrected Christ appeared to lots of eyewitnesses. This gospel is grounded in more than enough evidence and testimony. Let's pick up in verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God, God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. The word of the Lord. So Paul's directly addressing a problem in the Corinthian church. That's what's true of most of the epistles. They're addressing a problem. And some people had apparently been claiming that there was not gonna be a resurrection. We're not going to rise from the dead. But those same people didn't have a problem saying that Christ had been raised from the dead. That much everyone agreed on, but we're not going to rise. Paul says, wait a second. If there's no resurrection for you, then you can't say Christ was raised. The two things go together. Christ was raised, and we will rise. If we don't rise, then Christ didn't rise. And furthermore, if Christ did not rise, then we're wasting our time. This gospel business, it gives us no hope for the future and the afterlife. And by the way, we're really pitiful right now if we believe this. Let's keep reading, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, that'd be Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, and then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. Did you hear the visions of Daniel in Paul's words? Those who belong to Christ are raised from the dead. Christ destroys dominions and authorities and power. All those enemies of God are put under his feet. Let's keep reading, verses 30 to 32. As for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. 
If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. The word of the Lord. Paul says, what's the point of suffering for God if there's no resurrection? If this is all there is, if there's no life beyond the grave, then good grief. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Why are we bothering? Why are we trying to be good and doing good works? Why? Suffering is stupid. <laughs> Grab everything you can while you can, because nothing's coming next. But Paul keeps going. First with an admonition to shape up and then with a lengthy response to what he, cons what he actually considers a side issue. Uh, so let's keep reading in verse 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. <laughs> For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, well, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. And there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and the stars differ from star in splendor. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, by which he means Christ, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. As is of the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. The word of the Lord. It's not wrong to wonder about how resurrection works. Uh, what kinds of bodies will we have? Will we be the same shape and size that we are now? Uh, what language will we speak? Will we have the same voices? And so on. If Paul had the answers to these kinds of questions, he doesn't give them. What he does say is, look, your body now, your aging, sagging, balding, whatever body, <laughs> is just the seed that's going to become an imperishable and glorious body, like that of the resurrected Jesus himself. Paul says, that's good enough for now. That's all you need to know. And then he goes on. And in this section, we hear the great hope of the believer, that day when every fo the follower of Jesus longs for. We're going to pick up in verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. 
I don't know about you, but I can't hear these verses without hearing Handel's Messiah in my head. Uh, that magnificent trumpet solo, um, the trumpet shall sound, the dead will be raised. If you have not heard it, go home and Google it because it will bring you to tears possibly. It does me. The dead will be raised. We will be changed. Amen? Let me try that again. <laughs> the, dead, the trumpet shall sound, the dead will be raised, and we will all be changed. Amen? Amen. Death will be no more, vanquished forever by the victory that's been won by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. But Paul doesn't end there. We said amen, but he's not done. All of these wonderful promises about resurrection and new bodies and an imperishable future, all these things yet to come matter now. They're not just for singing about and looking forward to, though they're certainly for that. Paul says all of this matters now. It makes a difference now. And here's how. Listen to his conclusion, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The word of the Lord. Therefore, stand firm. Because we know Christ was raised, we know we will rise. Death will be vanquished. We will live and reign with him. Because all these things are true, we can be and we should be faithful. We can and we must endure. Stand firm. I lived in Grand Rapids for a total of six years, and I attended a church there for a while. Once, well, I attended church all the time, but in one particular church, the pastor ended the service the same way every week. Every week in his benediction, he included this sentence. Friends, we live in a world where a resurrection has happened. What he meant by that was, take heart. Even when the world and the circumstances around you call into question whether God is active and alive, take heart. Remember the circumstances of the resurrection? Remember what happened before the resurrection? It looked like God's greatest defeat. His own son had come to save the world and he couldn't even save himself. But the story didn't end there. And it is the fact of Christ's resurrection that changes the way we see the world. He arose, brought to life by the power of God, when it sure looked for a couple days like God didn't care. Take heart. The God of the book of Daniel, the Most High God, the King and God and Lord of all the earth, of every tribe, nation, people, the one on the highest throne possible, that God gives us every reason to be encouraged. Even when it does not look to you like he is ruling the earth very well, even when you cannot see evidence of his power, be encouraged, things are not what they always seem to be. God is in control. He is on the throne. Take heart. We live in a world where a resurrection has happened. And stand firm. Because that resurrection happened, we too will rise. No matter what happens this side of the grave, we will one day rise and reign with him over a newly created world where there is no more death or pain or sorrow. Take heart, my friends, and stand firm. Let's pray. Oh, most high God, we long for that day when you make all things new, and we pray that until then we will find the courage and the strength to endure. In Jesus' name.